The Japanese are famous for treating business like war, and if we look at the landscape right now, the new frontier is actually humanoid robots, and anyone who fails to arm themselves on this important new battlefront could be extinct soon. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. First, a really big congratulations to Tesla for another record quarter Q4 deliveries, and of course a record 2023 with over 1.8 million vehicles delivered. This episode, which I think is a rather important one for people to pay attention to, came from a mashup of two different areas. Number one, of course, is the advent and rapid growth of really sophisticated humanoid robots, but the second actually comes from a totally different area. It comes from one Jason P. Lowry, who is actually in the US Space Force, is a graduate of MIT, and published a book about Bitcoin and war. And that idea alone is incredibly intriguing. I will leave a link to one of his videos in the description. Interestingly enough, he published his thesis, but that has since been withdrawn and so it's no longer available publicly and he is not making any more public broadcasts or interviews or anything like that since I believe around July of 2023. So this is really interesting in its own right. Jason, if you're ever interested in coming on my show and talking about this, I would love to, though it sounds like you may be, I don't know, <laughs> there may be forces that are telling you not to do this right now. So anyway, I will leave that alone. But the specific impetus is a story that Jason has retold several times and that is of a cannon maker coming to Constantinople. I don't recall the year, sorry. I don't have all the details right in front of me right now. But anyway, he came to Constantinople. He said, I've got this new technology. It is cannons. It's basically, you know, you, you have a, a tube of iron. You can put gunpowder in it and you can shoot balls of iron at other people and destroy them. The ruler in Constantinople said, no, that is way too expensive. We don't need it. We've got these huge walls, no big deal. Well, within a year or two, that enemy had sold the technology to Constantinople's enemies and they were able to blast down the walls with these cannon, you know, these walls that had stood for a thousand years or so, they were able to blast down the walls and invade Constantinople and thus was effectively the end of the Roman Empire because of course Rome actually transferred itself from Rome to Constantinople when the fall of Rome happened. So that was sort of the last vestiges of the Roman Empire that were there. That was destroyed, they were invaded and that was the end of things. So it was a very big mistake on the part of Constantinople. And the point Jason is making is when you get a new technology in war, you have to use that technology. It is not a question of, is it expensive? Can I afford it? What is the point of it? It is, you have to stay up with this technology. If you don't, you are going to, you know, be taken over by somebody who has that technology. And think of that what you will. I have to say, I'm very conflicted about that whole thing myself because I, I'm very conflicted about war itself, but I do also understand the need for a standing military as well. But what I want to do is turn that from war, actual war into business war and think about humanoid robots in terms of that battlefront, if you want to think about it analogously. So we've got a new quote unquote battlefront in terms of humanoid robots. And if you think about this, like the engineer coming to the government of Constantinople and saying, I've got this new technology, here you've got a bunch of companies now, not just Tesla, but many companies that are working on humanoid robots at various degrees of dexterity for their hands or no hands at all, or looking like humans or just looking like a couple of legs with something to stand things on. There's a bunch of different form factors, but these are all sort of congealing right now because the technology finally exists. It's like what Tony Saba said about the iPhone. You know, when the iPhone came out, it was at the right moment in 2007 for all of the different technologies to congeal, to create something like an iPhone, and now we all have smartphones. It's the new year, and that means time to form more sustainable and better fitness habits. Better fitness is not an all or nothing situation, however. We all still want to enjoy life and our friends. That's why I love Zbiotics. Zbiotics allows me to enjoy nights out in moderation while working towards my 2024 goals. Zbiotics Pre Alcohol Probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct and not dehydration that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Go to zbiotics.com slash Dr. No or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use Dr. No at checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code so you can stay prepared no matter the time or the occasion.
And ZBiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. During the holidays, I discovered what a huge difference ZBiotics makes for those celebratory evenings. I would drink a bottle of ZBiotics before hanging out with friends, stay hydrated between drinks, and the next day I felt great. And I was even happy to hit the gym the next morning. ZBiotics is a real game changer for fun nights. With the new year, give yourself the gift of a better tomorrow with ZBiotics. Just remember, ZBiotics is the drink you drink before drinking. Be sure to head to zbiotics.com slash Dr. No and use the code Dr. No at checkout for 15% off. Thanks to Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode. And now let's get back to it. And of course, for a couple of decades, we've seen companies like Boston Dynamics and other companies begin to work on this. But 2022 and especially 2023 showed us a real kind of Cambrian explosion in terms of humanoid robots and specifically their capabilities. And a lot of that has to actually do with the brain more than the brawn. It, it is a big deal that they figured out how to do actuators and have everything be battery operated rather than hydraulically operated. All of that kind of stuff that Boston Dynamics has done because you're able to turn from very, very big batteries that only last an hour or two to smaller battery packs that are able to last a full day, like eight or 10 hours or something along those lines. So that's a big deal. But the really, really big deal is transplanting the brain in the form of neural networks into these robots and allowing them to learn and to have manual dexterity like the Tesla bot generation two does. I mean, the fact that it's able to pick up an egg and all of that is just amazing stuff. You're able to transplant that brain into a fairly capable humanoid form robot. And what that gives you from a consumer standpoint is something really cool that you could have around the house like a butler or something, but that's not where the big money is. The big money is in factories and replacing workers with these humanoid robots. And while in 2023, we saw some of these robots beginning to make inroads into companies doing some experimental work, you know, like looking at whether they could replace certain workers and things like that. My prediction is that 2024, we are going to see this expand radically. We're going to see a lot more of these in factories. And by the end of 2024, setting up into 2024, we will start to see an actual, you know, significant amount of these robots taking people's jobs in factories, doing those jobs that at first people don't like, dull and dangerous kind of jobs, things that people don't enjoy doing anyway. They will take those and then they will start to grow out from there into the broader factory landscape. And then of course, after that into retail, into sales, into things like that, it'll grow out and out and out. And at the same time that we're seeing creative jobs being taken from disembodied AI at the top end of things, we're going to see robotics start to squeeze jobs from the lower end as well. So we're going to go both manual labor and also creative labor, and we're going to really start to squeeze human beings. And of course, one of my predictions for 2024, but especially 2025, is we're really going to start to see the squeeze in terms of labor pool. We're going to see AI start to really take the place of human laborers, both on the mind side of things and also on the physical side of things. And of course, if you're a working age human being, that should scare the living daylights out of you. It certainly scares me to death. But if you're a business owner, look at what you've got here. You've got a situation where let's just say you pay somebody $50,000 a year, again, just picking out numbers, but whatever. You pay somebody $50,000 a year to screw in some bolts into a vehicle or something in a factory. And then on top of that, you've got medical care, you've got compensation, retirement plans, all of that kind of stuff you add on. So let's say it costs you $75,000 a year. Again, the numbers don't particularly matter here. It's just sort of orders of magnitude. But let's say an employee that works eight hours a day costs you $75,000 a year. Well, if you can replace that employee with a robot that say costs $40,000 a year, even if it's that much money, you're still going to save quite a bit of money in the long run. But the likelihood is that that robot will not just replace one laborer, but at least two. So it'll be able to work 16 hours a day with charging breaks and things like that. And then you're getting $150,000 for $40,000, even if it costs that much money. And again, you know, I don't know what these things are going to cost per year, but but order of magnitude, it's going to be in the 10,000 type range of cost. It's not going to cost $100,000 a year. I doubt it. But even if it does, honestly, that's still a good deal, right? Even if it's hundred grand a year, if you can replace two $75,000 human beings, that still saves you $50,000 a year. And now we get back to that Japanese idea of business as war. If your company A, and let's say you have 100 employees and you replace 50 of those with robots, and your company B, and you make the exact same thing and you have 100 employees, 
employees and you don't replace any of those with robots, who is going to be able to manufacture that widget for less money and or make more profit? Obviously, it's going to be company A that has replaced half the workforce with robots because they will simply cost less money than the human beings do per year. And that, my friends, is the equivalent of the Canon and Constantinople. If you are a business that's like, I don't need to replace my humans, everything is fine. We're making our widgets for $10 a piece and we're selling them for $15 a piece. Doesn't really matter. Well, you're gonna change your mind really, really quickly when the other company comes in and is able to manufacture their widget for say $6.50 and can sell it for $12.50 out on the open market. That means that the consumer is going to obviously, if we have the exact same thing and, and we can buy it for 18 or 20% cheaper, the consumer is going to flock to that cheaper product. And that means that company B is simply going to go out of business eventually, or they're going to have to buy or rent these robots in order to compete with company A. And that is just going to be the lay of the land. As these robots are built and as they take over more and more of the workforce, more and more of the workforce is going to be forced to hire the robots, even if they don't want to. And that is kind of, I don't know whether you want to call it a virtuous cycle or a non-virtuous cycle. Depends on whether you're the factory owner or not. But whichever way you look at it, the more robots that are in the workforce, the more robots that are going to be in the workforce. Because everyone who buys a robot is going to be able to build their widgets for a little bit cheaper than the person next door, or they're going to be able to do retail sales for a little bit cheaper. Imagine if you go into a Macy's or something like that, and half of the salespeople are robots rather than humans. That's a lot of monetary savings that would accrue to a company like Macy's having robots working, even if it's just doing things like sorting clothes and stuff like that, or potentially ringing up sales. Maybe the robot can even ring up sales, you know, with having like a card reader on its chest or something. So not only would it save Macy's money, but it would actually make the customer experience better because you could talk to the robot, you could ask it about size of clothes or whatever it is you need to do. And then you're like, well, I really like this pair of pants. And the thing's like, well, do you want to ring it up right here? And you just go like, bloop, and you know, put your card on the thing's chest and you're out the door. You don't have to go stand in line so a human being at a cash register can do that. All of this kind of stuff would be more convenient. So there are going to be benefits to consumer facing products, but especially at first, again, it's going to be in factories because there aren't as many regulations involved in factory work as there would be with dealing from an unregulated environment where human beings like customers are walking around. In a factory, it's a much more regulated environment. And so I predict that, you know, we're not going to see retail robots next year by any means, but we will see them in factories by next year. And again, the more robots that are in the workforce, the more robots that are in the workforce. It's one of those kinds of things where it's going to expand by necessity. It's going to be if you want to stay competitive as a business and the person competing with you gets robots, you're going to have to get robots as well, whether you want to or not. Otherwise, you're going to be Constantinople and you're going to get your walls broken down and you will cease to exist and then there will still be more robots in the world. So who stands to gain from this? In a weird way, we consumers do because of course we will have to pay less money for our widgets. On the other hand, we consumers will really, really suffer for it because we won't have any money anymore because we won't be employed because so many of our jobs will be taken over by robots. So that's really a double-edged sword. The second person who will benefit, of course, is going to be the business owner. And again, that's whether it's disembodied or embodied AI. But in this case, I'm talking specifically about humanoid robots and factory work and things like that. So manufacturers will benefit a lot. And then, of course, the big, big, big winners that I haven't really mentioned so far is the people who build the robots and especially the ones who can build them at scale. So there are a number of companies that are building humanoid robots right now, and they're very, very impressive. But the only company I know that is building out these humanoid robots with the brains and the mechanics and the physical dexterity and the ability to mass manufacture them at the scale that's going to be needed to meet the demand that's going to immediately happen as soon as robots start going out into the factory workforce is, of course, Tesla. And that's really why the Gen 2 Tesla bot is such a big deal, because it's the kind of thing you can see from the way it's made. It's not the perfect robot or anything, but it's the perfect combination of a good enough robot that can do amazing things and work in a factory or something, and the cost and mass manufacturability of the robot at the same time. So if Tesla can build these, it really doesn't even matter if it costs them forty or $50,000 to build one of these robots initially, which it well could because, again, this is new technology. It really doesn't matter. At first, they'll use it in their own factories and maybe replace one human $75,000 person. And so the ROI on the robot will be less than a year to replace a single human. And of course, that's just assuming it's only able to do one human's work for a period of time. It's going to eventually get better and better at that. But even if it's only able to do that and it costs $50,000 per unit to build, or even 100000 in that case, instead of being like three quarters of 
of a year, it'll be like a year and a half before it's able to return its investment. But no matter what, Tesla wins by having these Gen 2 Tesla bots out on the line working. And then of course, once they can even come close to meeting their needs, let's say they manufacture 10,000 or 20,000 or 50,000 or whatever it is that they feel that they need to fulfill their own internal needs, they can start leasing them to other companies to work in their factories. They are unlikely to sell these things for a very long time. They are very, very likely to lease these two companies because that's ongoing revenue that they'll get. So again, let's say that they lease it to a company for 50 grand a year. That company is going to be more than happy to take a robot that can replace two human beings at $150,000 for $50,000 a year. That is a total win for them. And then for Tesla, who by the time they're leasing it to other companies is probably going to be able to build this thing for like $20,000 or something. If that runs for five years, they get $250,000 for $20,000 to build it. And let's say $5,000 a year to maintain it or something along those lines. That is a pretty nice return. And as you get more and more of these, like I said, once some people have these robots in factories, they're going to have to have more and more and more. And so Tesla is going to have essentially an infinite demand for these Tesla bots. And of course, to be clear, I'm not saying that Tesla is going to be the only winner in this race. This is going to be such a gigantic pool that there will be many, many people who will be able to be very successful in this. And I actually wish good luck to all of them because I think there's a lot of really good humanoid robots out there. But I think that Tesla is going to be the number one company. Maybe there's going to be a Chinese company that will come in and compete for that, just like BYD is doing on the EV front. And I think that's all to the good to have this kind of competition. But I don't see anyone else who is set up for this kind of insane level of success because Tesla is just going to be able to manufacture huge numbers of these robots and who else is going to be able to do that very, very quickly? I just don't know. Anyway, if business is war, humanoid robots are the new cannons, the new technology, and everybody is going to have to get on board with that and adopt the new technology and utilize it or else they're going to go out of business. And while that's really scary for those of us who are working and are likely to be replaced by robots, I see this as kind of inevitable. I don't really see any other way that this is going to play out. And the winners, of course, are going to be the factory owners who can replace place humans with robots. And the big, big, big winners are going to be companies like Tesla that are able to mass manufacture these very smart robots that will be able to take the place of so many workers. Again, the demand is quasi infinite because once we cover the earth with robots, we can put them in space and we can turn them loose out there to do whatever it is they need to do. So the demand for this over 100 years or 150 years could be in the trillions of these robots. It's that kind of level of insanity. And now that these robots actually exist, there is no longer any question of what's going to happen. The trajectory is going to take place because any company that doesn't play along and adopt this new technology is going to cease to exist and only the companies that do adopt this new technology will exist in a period of time. I'm not going to say five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it is. At some period of time, people who don't adopt robots will be like whip manufacturers for buggies or something like that. I guess there probably are some artisan whip manufacturers still out there, but it's not the kind of thing that anybody does as a real business anymore. So it is a brave new world. And in 2024, we're going to see the very first steps of this process, which is going to be unstoppable. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting and thought provoking and perhaps a little bit scary. If you did enjoy it, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon, my YouTube channel members, and of course, my ex subscribers. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel in any way that you can. And if you want to join any of the teams, just check out the links in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Tesla bot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And finally, a big thanks once again to Zbiotics for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description and use Dr. No at checkout to save 15% off your order. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you.